Tokyo, my dear, dear friends. This is Daisuke, and I very, very much hope that this video finds you well and in very, very good spirits wherever you are in the world. And today, if you don't mind, I would very much like to continue on with the 31 days of gangster films and police films from the year 1970 to the present day. And it is my hope that this can afford us, you and me, with the opportunity, my dear, dear friends, to be able to speak about as many films as possible over the course of these 31 days in the context of these electrifying, entertaining, and thought-provoking genres of cinema entertainment, those being the gangster film genre and the police film genre, respectively. And for today, specifically for purposes of this video, I'd like to focus in on a film, or I should say, series of films that uh, I'd like to discuss in the context of the police film genre. Although, I admit as well that these films could also very reasonably, very fairly, very comfortably be discussed in the context of the gangster film genre as well. In that, these involve stories over the course of three films that are interconnected in, in a type of sequel or prequel types of relationships with the original film from 2002. These are films that deal both with police characters and organized crime criminal characters or uh, 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 gangster characters. And there is overlap between these two sides of the coin in terms of secrets, betrayals, hidden identities, uh, informants, uh, whistleblowers, moles, who's who, can we really trust this person, is this person really who this person says that this person is, or is there a type of hidden agenda that is lurking beneath the surface? And so there is this ever-evolving, uh, ever-dynamic interplay between both sides, the police, law enforcement side, and then the criminal element side. So in that way, I acknowledge that this film or series of films could be uh, discussed in the context of the gangster film genre. However, they could also be discussed in the context of the police film genre. And so I've chosen to, uh, to bring these up in that context today. And I'm speaking of works. I've mentioned the first film from 2002. And then we have the prequel sequels that uh, followed in the following year, 2003. And they are from the filmmakers Andrew Lau and Alan Muck. And there are so many interconnecting stories, but there's also a type of continuity uh, and a back and forth in time, but uh, revolving around various, say, central characters that uh, emerge in the scene and which are, uh, which are portrayed by uh, various uh, actors and performers who, as I say, emerge depending on, uh, and emerge in degrees of prominence depending on what films we're talking about in this series of films. So, for example, we have great actors and performers like uh, Karina Lau and Anthony Wong and Eric Tsang and Edison Chen and, and Sean Yu and Tony Leung and Andy Lau. Uh, and these are works that are set against the backdrop of Hong Kong over the sprawling epic of time and space and law enforcement and crime and uh, hidden agendas and betrayals and informants and moles and whistleblowers and secret identities uh, and the like. And these are the films that are, and please pardon me for my poor pronunciation of the language, Mogando Hylet, or as they are known in English, Infernal Affairs. So we are speaking about Infernal Affairs and Infernal Affairs 2 and Infernal Affairs 3. So these films from 2002 to 2003. And they span, the stories themselves span a wide expanse of years, uh, focusing perhaps uh, somewhat prominently during this period of the 1990s, including uh, the period of uh, 1997, which is, as you know, a very key and important historic year in the context of Hong Kong 
and also in the context of Hong Kong's relationship with China. Uh, and so there's that and so much more embedded, built in, uh, uh, foundationally relevant in the context of these films. Once again, Infernal Affairs, Infernal Affairs 2 and Infernal Affairs 3. So what are we dealing here with? So let's focus in on the first film, Infernal Affairs, which is a story about police and the criminals and the cross-section between those two sides because we have the Andy Lau character and the Tony Leung character who primarily portray both sides or both sides at the same time. So one character being a police officer who is actually uh, a, a member or whose uh, whose allegiances belong to uh, the uh, local uh, organized crime element and so he is undercover as a police officer but really uh, he is siding with the, uh, the criminals whereas we have on the other side uh, an undercover cop who is undercover within the same criminal organization and so we have informants or moles that are paralleling and mirror imaging each other. And they do not necessarily know of each other's existence, although that begins to change. And that begins to change over the course of these tense uh, scenarios and exchanges and uh, episodes where we have the interplay between the law enforcement side and the criminal element side. And gradually, or maybe not so gradually, perhaps abruptly and quite, uh, quite severely, uh, the, the film progresses towards uh, these various possible interconnections and encounters between these two sides. Again, the hidden agendas of both characters, the Andy Lau character and the, the Tony Leung character, each with their own, say, purpose and their own set of psychological uh, traumas and pressures and stresses uh, trying to essentially... Uh, 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 you know, better the other side with their own, uh, say, motivations and goals and ambitions, while also trying to stay hidden, while also trying to evade capture and evade uh, detection, while also trying to keep a grip on their own senses of themselves and the realities around them. And depending on which story we are following, whether it's the Andy Lau character story or the Tony Leung character story, maybe that sense of, of a grip on on a type of, of uh, um, a solid foundational uh, a type of uh, uh, serenity or stability. It might be upended, it might be off-balanced, depending on which character uh, plot we are following, this, the arc we are following. And so we have this glorious and wonderfully confusing, beautifully confusing interplay between the two sides, and they keep switching. And they keep, as I say, the, the dynamics keep changing. And the scenarios in terms of, of uh, the police enforcement and the criminal elements in which, uh, which are the subject of the various inquiries, investigations, and operations, when those begin to build to a fever pitch, again, that's where the identities begin to crack. And that's where the risk of discovery begins to grow even higher and higher and higher. And indeed, if discovery occurs, then that can mean the end. That could mean curtains for these characters that are that are part of these these stories here. And I should say too that the paralleling or mirror imaging in terms of the motivations and the psychologies of these characters as portrayed so brilliantly by Andy Lau and Tony Leung respectively, this adds this beautiful breadth of dimension and heart and emotion uh, to the proceedings as well as being these taut and suspenseful and very, very well put together uh, uh, scenes of action in an assembly that is also an action film as well as a crime drama, as well as a police procedural drama, as well as a human drama that is about stress and tension and identity and sense of self as well as sense of the of the environment around oneself so with the uh, great central performances by these two consummate actors that are giving us their all in their own ways this is really a treat such a cinematic treat this is a classic 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 film and Andy Lau and Tony Leung deliver caliber top caliber performances each in their own way and uh, we might feel like we are sympathizing with one side over the other maybe we are are finding ourselves uh, allured or, or captivated by uh, characters that are otherwise quite villainous or quite uh, 
quite, uh, uh, quite dastardly. And the other uh, equation might be uh, similar as well. Maybe we are finding ourselves to question uh, the motivations of characters that are otherwise very heroic or very uh, noble, etc. And that blend, that cross-section, and that blurring of the lines is one of the fascinating aspects of a film like Infernal Affairs, while at the same time upping the ante in terms of the ingenuity of the situations, the way in which the parallels cross and, and tie into knots and risk uh, bringing down the entire house of cards all together while at the same time you have these two characters that are doing their utmost each in their own respective ways to preserve their own sense of order and their own sense of stability which itself is based on a lie it's based on a type of, of uh, uh, a psychologically based trickery either vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis the world around them or vis-a-vis -vis themselves and therein lies the great wonderfully constructed dilemma of the uh, of the central characters of the film infernal affairs what a brilliant 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 work this is uh and uh, uh it is a classic of the genre i think if, as many of you know uh, it it also uh gained uh a lot of uh discussion uh with the uh the uh, the advent of uh of say other films uh say for example by martin scorsese in the departed uh and that always brought to the discussion uh the uh, the film infernal affairs and uh, whatever the case may be uh, however this film uh is brought to the radars of many a film goer across the world in any event we do have this stellar stellar entertainment that is so bold so ambitious so clever so tense and exciting and so emotional and so devastating and so exhilarating all at once this is the work infernal affairs my goodness what a fantastic work this is now when we get to the following year and we get to the, uh, the sequels which are internal or prequels sequels i should say infernal affairs 2 and infernal affairs 3 we get some very interesting uh, interesting developments and treatments of the story and maybe revisiting of various elements that were either hinted at or perhaps directly uh, relevant to the first film, Infernal Affairs. And so I think maybe depending on who you are, maybe for some, maybe these prequels slash sequels uh, might not be as effective as, say, the first film, Infernal Affairs, and that's okay. And maybe, to be even more specific, maybe when we think about Infernal Affairs 2 or Infernal Affairs 3, maybe one film works more or less than the other as well uh, and that's okay dude that's not a problem or maybe for you you want to stick with the film infernal affairs and that's okay too i think infernal affairs as a f the first film i think operates so well on its own uh, that one doesn't necessarily need to visit the second film or the third film however however i should say that for me infernal affairs 2 let's start there infernal affairs 2 is a very very clever film it it has this way of expanding the world by visiting the past and uh it, we have this interesting interplay between the performances of these characters now uh primarily uh, uh in the in the embodiment of the performance by edison chen and sean you respectively uh, and so there was a hint of this of course in the first film but now it's made very prominent in the second film in this prequel fashion that is also expanding over the course of many years and the build-up uh let's say through the 90s of their own respective characters and their own respective say uh, implementations or integrations into their respective societies while the 90s are progressing in Hong Kong leading up to and through 1997. And so we have this fascinating story of pasts intertwining of certain circumstances and, and involvements of character and plot that we were uh, privy to in the first film now almost being turned on their heads in a manner of speaking. And so things that we might have thought occurred in the first film are actually, uh, relatively speaking, or perhaps potentially radically different uh, when we get to the second film. And we therefore realize that the world is expanding before our very eyes while at the same time uh, uh, diving into the past and looking at how 
uh, characters uh, led up to, or what were the circumstances led, that led up to where the characters find themselves when they get to the first jump. So there is a very important uh, relationship between Infernal Affairs 2 and Infernal Affairs 1. Indeed, if one is watching Infernal Affairs 2, one, I would say, needs the background of the first film before going to the second film. Uh, so uh, if you are interested in the continuation in an interesting chronological take uh, that is also, I think, expanding the world or potentially expanding the world, uh, I think uh, Infernal Affairs 2 is, is a great place to go and I enjoy it very much. Perhaps I enjoy, or I can say, you know, I enjoy the first film immensely. And uh, I maybe uh, if I had to rank them, the first film would be tops for me. Absolutely tops for me. But that doesn't take anything away from my enjoyment of the second film because of these reasons. So this is uh, one of the great, I think, strengths and joys of the second film. Uh, namely, this revisit revisiting of the past and revisiting of events that actually sh uh, potentially uh, creates a different perspective on what we might have already seen in the first film. So uh, this is building the world in that manner of speaking in a prequel-like fashion, more or less. Now, when we get to the third film, Infernal Affairs 3, again, it's the same or similar type of dynamic. You know, one can really uh, have the first film, Infernal Affairs, and stay with that and have that be the film that, that is the definitive telling of the story of these characters and not necessarily go to the uh, second film or the third film. That's fine. That's fine. But, again, I can speak from my own, my own experience. When I saw Infernal Affairs 3... For the first time, I was so uh, I was so intrigued by it, but for a number of reasons, it was one of these films that has a parallel structure, at least a parallel structure. Perhaps it's you know it, it might have parallel or more structures, but my point is that it is dealing with multiple timelines and thus multiple story points, both the past and the present slash future. And so in that way already we have this intriguing setup while all these uh, multiple timelines, each timeline is related through the second film back to the first film. And indeed we have therefore the Infernal Affairs 3 as a type of sequel and also as a type of of mini sequel slash prequel in the certain manner of speaking. So in that way it forms a very intriguing uh, stepping stone vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, its relationship with the first film and vis-a-vis -vis its relationship with the second film. So it serves as a further developing of the backstory in a manner of speaking while also serving as a direct sequel follow-up to the events that we might have seen at the end of the first film. So it, it's doing a many things at once. It is doing a lot of things at once. And there is this wonderful way in which these timelines are interwoven between and among each other so that we get the sense of, of, of an ebb and flow. And also we get a sense of time. And also we get a sense of how uh, characters uh, that might have existed in the past, that may not exist in the present, how we can still feel their presence and feel their life. And they can still exist in the world of the film uh, long after uh, certain ev events or circumstances might have occurred to them, say, in previous films. So it, in that way, it serves as this magical ride of a film while also uh, attempting to, say, tie up certain loose ends or certain uh, th uh, plot points or thread points that might have been left uh, ambiguous, say, in, the pr uh, in any previous uh, storyline uh, dealings that we might have seen in the previous work. So in that way, it serves as a really, uh, a really potentially uh, uh, a fulfilling conclusion to what we have seen in the previous films as well as having its own share of, of very clever uh, interactions and interplay. Also, I should say, too, that Infernal Affairs, uh, one of the great strengths of these films, is the way in which it shows a type of psychological complexity. Uh, and we get this, uh, for example, very, very strongly in Infernal Affairs 3, you know, the way in which guilt and, uh, uh, guilt and remorse uh, really take its toll on various characters to the point of being almost, um, uh, almost uh, uh, hampering 
and uh, almost um, hindering uh, their uh, attempts to uh, essentially live out quote unquote normal lives or normal activities. And so there is this idea of the psychological stresses or trauma, which also is linked to another great theme overarching these entire films, especially or in particular the first one, which is the idea of a type of divine retribution. Uh, through a sense of uh, dealings with, say, uh, uh, Buddhist teachings and the like, or an outlook of uh, on existence and philosophy uh, that has something to do with uh, retribution, that has something to do with uh, um, an optimistic viewpoint on the one hand, and also a, con a concept of, say, internal, uh, eternal damnation and hell on the other hand, and how that is um, uh, played out in nuanced forms throughout the films, and indeed perhaps even in direct forms uh, throughout the films. Uh, for example, and in particular, say in certain key and crucial moments in say Infernal Affairs 3. And so uh, these are, I think, linked so well in terms of the interconnecting web of lies and deceit and honor and loyalty while at the same time showing this layer of, say, a religious philosophy, while also setting itself against the backdrop of this ever-changing landscape of Hong Kong vis-a-vis uh, -vis itself and vis-a-vis -vis its relationship with, uh, with China, as well as setting forth uh, these incredibly organized and arranged uh, storylines and interacting and interconnecting uh, web of, of, uh, of action set pieces and suspense uh, setups uh, that are uh, thrilling and cleverly designed uh, that also traverse time and space itself while telling these wonderful stories that uh, seem to uh, uh, turn uh, back on themselves almost in this uh, brilliantly circular way. And I think that is uh, due to the brilliance of the structure and the dynamics, as well as the, uh, the enthralling nature of the performances, the absorbing nature of the performances and what they all bring in their uh, multidimensional aspects throughout these uh, cycle of films, uh, Infernal Affairs. My goodness, uh, what great films they are. And, uh, you know, I mentioned that for me, I do enjoy Infernal Affairs 2, and I do enjoy Inf uh, Infernal Affairs 3. I think they're very clever in terms of their design. And then ultimately, though, I, I have to go back to my utter, utter enjoyment with Infernal Affairs. Uh, this film is a standout. This is an absolute standout. And so however you want to, you, to uh, uh, approach this uh, work, if you want to approach it just in terms of the first film or you want to approach it in terms of a trilogy, whatever the case may be, you are in for one heck of a cinematic ride uh, through uh, the story of Infernal Affairs. If you haven't seen uh, this film or these films yet, I strongly, strongly, strongly encourage you to do so. These are absolutely fantastic and you are in for uh, a great cinematic ride indeed. These are the films in the series of films, Infernal Affairs. Okay, my dear friends, so that's it for now. And so until we meet again, please be happy and healthy and well. And please keep on watching a lot of great, great movies. Thank you so much, as always, for your time. I very, very much appreciate it. Stay strong, stay safe, and cheers.